Welcome to the Green Goddess Podcast. I'm your host, Tara. On this show, we explore sacred medicines and the evolution of consciousness. Our guest today is Kalindi Yi. Kalindi is a speaker on mushrooms. I've seen him speak personally at the Portland Psychedelic Conference and the Guy in Mind Conference in 2019, where he spoke about going really deep in the mushrooms. Um, Kalindi is known for mega doses, taking mega, mega doses way beyond what was considered a mere heroic dose. A mere heroic dose for most people is something like four or five grams. Kalindi, I've heard you say you have had. 20 gram doses is that right well uh, most doses that i have are around 25 but i do 50 uh 50 grams 50 grams so That's so right. Kalindi, yeah has has an incredible perspective that very few people i've ever met or heard about could possibly have the experience to share with us he is a mushroom explorer and an amazing speaker and I'm really excited to have you on the show, Kalindi. I, I want to know what what kinds of things do you learn going that deep and what's it like and how different is it from a five gram heroic dose or less? And yeah, tell us about the wisdom and the adventures that you get to have. You're so courageous. Well, uh, the main thing I learned from uh, the high dose is that the only thing that's impossible in the multiverse is to to die and not exist uh, if you are a living soul so that's what i one of the things that i've learned you know it's been a a journey and i've been on that same journey since uh since i started and to continue the exploration of of self inside of the mystery and that's really what it's about that we we're inside of a grand mystery and all of the things that uh, we think are real, that we think are the answers to the questions that we pose are um, basically just <laughs> just us uh, thinking about things that we, we can't understand, you know, because it is a mystery. Yeah. Wow. So how long do you end up? on a journey for with a 50 gram dose well the journey is the same length uh as uh five grams but uh, exponentially intense it's uh is deeper it's more connective it's uh more expansive it's a really definitely a area of of uh, of density as far as the information is concerned, as far as the experience is concerned. It's not like, um, you know, the the lower doses. It's an exponential, you know, connectivity to all of the the things that you do and experience and things like that uh, becomes past just geometric uh, configurations and worldly gigs and pretty colors and things like that and it goes off into vast landscapes uh, far away worlds and galaxies exotic and novel creatures it's a you know it's a it's a whole different animal when you're dealing with a full entheogenic dose because most people have not had a full entheogenic dose and that's including many of the luminaries in the psychedelic movement that we we look at and look to for guidance and information you know they've never been all the way in and the worst thing that you can be is halfway in you know halfway here and halfway into the other so that's what i try to do to uh, not be stuck in in both places at once when i want to get out i get out and uh, if it's some reason that I'm taking a, a smaller dose, then it's for a particular reason. But for the true hard work, you have to go deep, you have to go high, and you have to go hard, and you have to press forward 
rather than, um, as I said, be stuck halfway here and halfway in the other. So what do you consider a full dose? A full dose is access, where you no longer are in in this dimension, in this uh, construct, in this three-dimensional five-sense reality of which we exist, uh, a place where there are no reference points to what we call everyday reality. So it's access to the, the multiverse, um, uh, embedded simulations, uh, access to the other uh, very, very close dimensions that we talk about, you know, in our fantasies, but it is a place that you can access in real time. Thank you. So can you tell us about some of the worlds you visited? What do you see? Well, you see alien, uh, what you would consider alien landscapes, um, areas of, of information and learning that are not part of this, as I said earlier, construct, you know, the you have worlds where the skies are are different. You know, you may have orange sky and purple water. You know, you may have a being of which uh, some of the archetypes of the ancient world prior to the younger Dryas, you may see a being which would be close to what you would call Vishnu or Krishna in his four-armed configuration, um, where you would see, again, uh, archetypes of the ancient world, the human body with the bird's head, the human body with the head of a jackal. You would see the, uh, which would you would call the, the minotaur or uh, one of these different creatures. Then you'd have creatures that are not part of the icons of ancient history of which we still have records of that are beyond description because they're so different, so exotic, so otherworldly that they don't stick in our conscious minds because they're just so different. But you'll see all of the things that we uh, have in legend uh, all of our future legends, because a lot of our science fiction and a lot of our uh, movies and things like that are only pictures of the future of those people who have tapped into the future. So uh, those type of things are are prominent, you know. Mm-hmm. So what's your relationship like now with fear? Do you have it at all? Um, uh, fear is a, a natural part of consciousness, but uh, to uh, look at fear as uh, something that's un- unnatural or that doesn't happen is not realistic, but uh, a, a paralyzing fear, uh, a fear of where you are or different things that are happening is not part of the the natural fear construct because you are you know you are challenging yourself and to fear and still move forward to fear and still to go into those places that are what many deem fearful that is the building of of power that is the building of tenacity that is the way that you start to move into these realms uh, with a air of fearlessness, even though you may be fearful of some of the things that are there or you're going to contend with each time builds your power and you become number one, less fearful of the, you know, unnecessary fear. Um, you, You know, you become more, I guess what you say, courageous, you know, Mm -hmm. some things I fear, I fear, uh, sick grandchildren. Um, I I fear those type of things, not, 
the creatures in the multiverse that um, I challenge with my own spirit and that challenge me. That's not part of the fear construct. It's only when you view yourself as a human and not being a part of all the things that are there, that's when you have those irrational fears that uh, paralyze you and put you in a, a place where you don't, uh, you feel like you don't belong or that it's too overwhelming. So those type of things I don't, uh, I don't adhere to, you know. Mm -hmm. So what is the multiverse? The multiverse are repetitions inside of the simulation of uh, different worlds, many of which are the same as this one, many which are different, um, a place of all possibility. And they're not in this realm, but they are, I guess you say, cotangent with this realm. In other words, another universe is a, a breath away. Um, the membrane that separates different universes is as uh, is, is thin as you, is thinner than your skin. But these universes, which are a multiple of many universes, uh, exist in all space and time and they are accessible through the utilization of the the mushrooms, uh, the DMT compendium. So there are many different worlds, many different universes that you can access. And then there are the infraparticle worlds and universes that are the universes of the very, very small, as opposed to the macro universes that are part of the very, very large, which, you know, uh, you know, different galaxies and things like that, that are very, very large that we can see through telescopes and three, see through imagination and see through entheogens. So the multiverse is a construct of another dimension or another universe that exists side by side with the universe that we are in. And many times you have replicas of the self inside of the multiverse where, you know, uh, today, you know, I was out and my car is white and my shirt is blue. But in that other universe, um, the same thing is going on with certain changes where my car might be blue and my shirt might be white. And instead of going 60 miles an hour down the highway, I'm going 70. So they can be replicas, they can be different, but all of the possibilities of what universe could be with that you inside of it um, is there for your perusal and access to be in and to be able to experience. Mm, that makes sense. Interesting. So what have these adventures um given you how have you come back different well i come back different in a understanding of my higher self how i upload to my higher self and my higher self downloads to my what we would call normal self to build my higher self in the future but that future is not really a future because it's a continuum meaning that I am who I am in that higher self, but I'm playing the part. I'm doing the necessary things to become what I already am. Hmm. So what are some of the things that you've learned about the nature of the creator? I'm not a, uh, I don't adhere to that construct of a creator. Okay. Create anything in the understanding that I've had from gleaning inside of the multiverse. You have organizers. In other words, there are those that organize things from what is already in existence. 
you know, it's like, you know, you, as you say, you create a car, but you don't really create a car because you don't make steel and all that kind of stuff, but you can take steel and what's in the environment and create something that we call a car or organize something that we call a car. Creation in that sense is a limited creation because nothing can be created. The stuff that you use to uh, make or organize the things that we utilize and that we exist in are already there. They've always been there and will always be there. So you can organize, you know, a computer program to uh, play a certain game, but you can't create the basics or the basis of the things that are utilized to be able to create that, create that computer and computer program. So there's nothing there that is um, a creator like that is making things out of nothing. There are organizers that are taking the substances that are already there, organizing them into worlds and planets and uh, all of the things that we, you know, we uh, have a relationship with. But there's nothing out there creating anything because the stuff of what we call creation is already there. Now, it's semantics in certain levels where, you know, um, OK, I, like I said, I created the car, but the, you know, basic elements for steel and plastic and glass and all those things are already there. So you can say you created the car, but you really didn't create the car. You organized the car because all, all of the stuff that is utilized in the workings of the car was already here and you just organized it. So um, simulated universes, you know, running on uh, algorithms, computer programs is what we're existing in. Uh, so that's the way that I that I view the uh, the multiverse and the infraparticle realms as embedded simulations within simulations within simulations. Interesting. Hmm. So does that change how you interact with your daily life? No, it doesn't change how I react with my daily life. It's like, you know, you know, you're immortal and you can never die, but you know, that doesn't mean you run and jump off the cliff or run your car into a wall, you know, Number one, all that stuff hurts. And number two, you know, um, it's not necessary. Your time will come to step off into the greater mystery. You know, you don't have to hurry it up because you got all the time in the world to do what is necessary inside of the world. And when it's your time to move on, you move on. But you don't have to chase it or you don't have to be... Uh, you know, you don't have to be in a position where, you know, you have to make something happen that is uh, ultimately inevitable. Right. So why do you think that mushrooms are suddenly kind of coming into mainstream society? What do you think about the mushrooms themselves? Do you see them having a particular consciousness? Well, of course, they have a... Um, a consciousness, an organized consciousness. They're an organic technology. They're an artificial technology. They are sentient. They have an agenda of their own. And that agenda is to inculcate themselves into the human, um, you know, into the human destiny by giving information that's leading uh, those creatures that have the ability to be able to uh, unpin the information and knowledge, uh, giving them a chance to, uh, to grow and to expand and to move forward by accessing the knowledge of the library of what is the DMT compendium of knowledge, which some called, uh, such as the Theosophical Society, uh, the Theosophists, uh, like uh, Annie Besant and Helena petrova Levatsky and these people at the late part of the 19th century, some of the early 20th century, called the uh, Akashic Records, of which are called the Akashic Records because it's dealing with 
the Acacia or the Acacic records because it's dealing with the DMT compendium library because DMT is a library of knowledge and information that can be utilized by those creatures who have the ability to unlock and decipher and decode the informational structure of the psilocybin mushroom, which is nothing but an uh, ingestible form of dimethyltryptamine. Hmm. Wait, so you're saying psilocybin has DMT? Psilocybin is DMT. Is DMT? Yes. Oh, For okay. hydroxy and then dimethyltryptamine, that's psilocin. When you ingest the psilocybin inside of the mushroom, along with the baocystin, you get uh, psilocin because the psilocybin dephosphorylates in the, in the gut. And once it dephosphorylates from, you know, uh, from psilocybin turns into psilocin and psilocin is DMT for hydroxy and dimethyltryptamine. Thank you. That's really interesting. I didn't know that. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, so, it's, a, it's an ingestible form of DMT without a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Okay. So tell us a little bit more about the mushrooms as sentient creatures. Well, they they are they're organized. Uh, they were organized as mnemonic devices, as memory devices, to gather the family in this universe uh, to be able to remember the things that have gone on through successive generations of incarnations into, uh, into sentience. In other words, it shows you where you come from, points you in the direction that you're going because it has an agenda to ride with you. Once you eat the mushroom, the mushroom eats you and you become symbiotes. And uh, in that symbiosis, you get a chance to ride with the mushroom and the mushroom gets a chance to ride with you by getting into a physical body that it can move and that it can show you places and take you places and you can take it places because when we leave this planet, the mushrooms will leave with us in this dimension, in this universal construct. You know, when you go to Mars, you'll take your mushroom with you. When you go to uh, the Sirius star system or Alpha Draconis or the far out places in the universe, you'll take the mushroom with you and it'll gather information into the recorders. And, you know, that's that's what it does. It goes with you as it takes you where you need to go. So do you feel any kind of sense of, um, I mean, I guess like agenda, I mean, other than their own propagation, do you sense the mushrooms have a bigger agenda? Well, to uh, liberate this, the spirit and consciousness of man out of his manhood through the transhumanistic areas into the um, impossible mystery of the the universal the multiple universal constructs in other words it's its agenda is to um become through the inter the intercalation of of uh dmt and the mushrooms information into the dna as a block blockchain structure of holding on to that information to be able to take that information to the stars and into the quantum realm. Uses the human consciousness as a vehicle. Because we're, 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 we're moving into where we, we're merging into and with the machines of our own making. The machines <laughs> made us to make them 
for us to take them and them to take us into the mysterious and impossible places that you experience when you are on the journey, the trip. And what do your adventures with the mushrooms leave you thinking about the state of the world right now and its future? Well, I mean, the world's future is the world's future. It is to, at some point in time, cease to exist in this form and fashion and in this universal construct because at one some point in time, the sun will supernova and burn up this galaxy and the earth will no longer exist. But by that time, the creatures on earth would have by that time moved out into other parts of the solar system to other earths and things like that. Just as we did this one, uh, you know, some came here out of the 27 different humanoid types. Some came as pilgrims, some came as sick, shipwrecked adventurers some came uh as information and grew naturally some came with the admixture of uh the different creatures that were here emerging of those creatures with um i guess what you'd call extraterrestrial dna you know so you have different humanoid types here who you know uh, have different places and things to do and places to go but as far as the earth itself um you know high dose has very little to do with the areas of the earth um you know saving the whales or the rainforest and things like that has very little to do with that that's low dose informational structures so that if people wish to they can come up with a new firefighting equipment for the amazon uh, or something to deal with uh trying to um, slow down climate change which is pretty much uh not going to work because we're in the natural cycles of climate change we you know we came out of the little Ice Age and the uh, world is warming and it's been warming since the um, 18th century coming out of the Little Ice Age. Um, so it's going to continue to warm up since we're living in the best climate that we've been living in for the last uh, 12,800 years. All right. I'd like to shift gears a little bit. I'd like to know just some more of the the life-changing insights or just the profound insights that you've gotten from your journeys. I think it's so rare to have taken that much of a dose. And so many times you said you've got almost 50 years of experience of adventuring with the mushrooms. And I'd really love to know like what some of the wisdom is that you get from that level of depth. Can you share with us as an elder? Well, uh, we are we are eternal. We are from the mystery. We are, we've never been created or born and we will never die. And that's echoed and parroted in many of the wisdom schools of the earth. You know, uh, although most have been usurped for nefarious purposes to control But that's basically what the originators said, and their original vision uh, has been taken to a place and point of of corruption in many areas, you know. But the central theme is the same, uh, that there is more than just this which we exist in. There's more. There's so much more that we have access to and that we can experience and that we can feel and see and smell and taste. And that's the wisdom of the mushroom. It has a wisdom that there are beautiful and uh, wonderful places that are in the multiverse to 
be seen and experienced and loved and all of those things. But there's also the flip side of it. There's malevolence. There's horror. There is malice also. And it is being able to, uh, you know, as it, adhere to one as much as possible and try to avoid, and avoid, uh, avoid the other as much as possible. But you can't because that's part of the, the, essence of existence as a conscious being in the multiverse and in the world that there is the good and the bad the good and the bad the the yin and the yang there is a beyond this form that is just as much a part of the essence of who we are as the human form i want to ask you about this idea of malice so my personal perspective tends to be that at our core, at least as far as humans go, we're innately good. And that when there is unkindness, it's a reaction to unresolved wounds and negative energy and pain that's just being directed ignorantly at others um, because it's being ejected from someone who doesn't know how to process it and doesn't have the tools to process it or the capacity to process it or perhaps is living in illusions and delusions and so I'm curious if you're seeing a different kind of paradigm where there's actual genuine malice that isn't sort of just skewed goodness there in my experience is genuine malice and evil and horrific energies, creatures, and these things are not flipped good. They are the opposite, the other. And it is just as real in the multiverse as it is in humankind. Many times we look at things and we try to uh, put it into a box when there's no box for it to go into. A thing is what a thing is. A is A. A is not B. Or corruption of B. You know, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have some people who have been hurt and they exhibit, you know, certain qualities because of that hurt that they felt and this miscued upbringing or something like that. But then you have creatures here that are totally unsympathetic or empathetic in their energy, in their hearts. And this is the type of thing that is uh, many times has been hidden. But um, in modern times with the availability of information, we know that, you know, there are uh, 70,000 um, women missing. There are hundreds of thousands of children missing, and they're not all in sex trafficking. Some are in the grip of evil entities that are real as your dog or your 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 best friend and things like that that have absolutely nothing to do with goodness and sweetness and love and things like that they're captured under the umbrella of some horrific beings and energies that permeate the the multiverse that permeate the infraparticle realms so there is evil, pure evil, just as there is pure good in our experiences. And anything other than that is, uh, that understanding is being naive. You know, it's like Father Flanagan in Boys Town. There's no such thing as a bad boy. No, there are some bad, there are some bad boys, and they're just bad because that's what they are. So do you think that there are people that are truly like this? Or do you think that people that are truly like this are actually being taken over by other kinds of beings that are running through them? 
Well, a person is a being also, and they can exhibit yes. the same qualities as those beings that are uh, what some would call greater and more powerful. Some are possessed by these energies. Some just exhibit these energies um, because that's what and who they are and who they are aligned with and who they uh, exhibit as their lineage of ancestry into other realms and other creatures. Mm. This is really fascinating. Could you share something you've seen personally in your journeys around these lines? As as far as, you know, um, I mean, uh, how can you des- describe these type of forces and energies and creatures if you haven't experienced it? I could say things, but it wouldn't mean anything because most people, 99% of the people <laughs> on Earth haven't experienced these things or these entities or these creatures. They will just say, oh, well, you're just taking mushrooms, you're tripping, it's not real, and, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's not part of my experience. But when you get into the deeper areas of this of this thing of ours, if you get into the uh, the dark places, and not, and I'm not saying dark in the sense of dark, because dark is the the mother of all things. Come from darkness. Light comes from darkness. So I'm not talking about the darkness that is the natural progenitor of all of the construct. I'm talking about a different type of darkness that, you know, is unex- unexplainable. There's no way to, to say what these things are. You have to be there. You have to experience it. And you have to, you have to stand. You have to be able to stand what reality really is. It's a grand mystery, and it's not all good bubbles, fairies, and the things that we would think are the way things are supposed to be. It's much different than what we suppose. Thank you. Well, I'm wondering if you have any adventure stories that you do feel like you can bring back on any subject. Well, I'm uh, uh, I'm a warrior. I have uh, transdimensional, interdimensional, ultra-dimensional, hyper-dimensional battles with different entities and creatures because I am the uh, epitome of one who travels into those dark places to challenge my power, to build my power, to take on those things that strengthen, those things that uh, bolster your courage, that make you more than what you were when you went into that space. So, uh, I mean, there are many battles and many uh, contentions against novel creatures and Uh, exotic creatures that are so different from what you would think or that you could imagine, you know, it's more than what your imagination can pull. It's not part of the uh, validation library of what the human imagination can pull out. You know, it's like um, Geiger who actually drew the, Creatures and space for the movies Alien uh, with Sigourney Weaver and uh, the other other Alien movies that merge mm-hmm. with Predator. He's they asked him. They said, "How how can a person's imagination make this stuff up?" You know, and he said, "I don't make this up. This is <laughs> this is what this is what it is." He says, "I just download it into a form that." People can see because I draw it. But he said, this exists. This is what I see. It's not something that I'm making up in my mind. This is real. So there are spaces out there that have that 
alien world construct. Does that type of figure match some things you've seen? Uh, you, you're talking about the alien world, the those type of things? Yeah, yeah, well, well yeah. I've been in uh, thousands of places like that. Creepy, creepy places, different places, and stuff so weird and so different that you you really can't pull it back into this. You just have to be in it and respond to it while you're in it, because you you're moving into new vistas, new paradigms, new ways of uh, of looking and responding because they're so different from this ordinary world or the ordinary imagination. That's why when people say Oh, where well, you're just um, pulling out inner uh, inner vistas, inner insight, and you're just making these things from your imagination uh, into a form of which you can relate to or see. But no, they are things that are not part of you, not coming out of you, not part of your imagination, not part of the general public domain of information you know uh so so there there's things that are different you know ways that are different right hmm. it's just i can't even imagine some of the things you must have been able to see in the other worlds and the other places and how that must affect your your sense of who you are and what's possible. Do you find that you have enhanced abilities to navigate this world? Well, it's the, it's, it's taken me around the world. It's protected me inside of the world and the places that I've been and uh, the things that I uh, experience here. If you can, you know, if you can hold fast and look the mystery in the eye then you can look and hold fast and look the world in the eye, you know, no matter where you go and what you do. You know, I, I'm a, a, a avid traveler. I, I like to, to travel and see new things here, and I'm an explorer of the multiverse. So I'm not a shaman or anything like that. You know, it's an overused um, term. It's the colloquial way of speaking to anybody who is a spiritual person who's not a a rabbi, a imam, or a priest, you know. Um, they used to call them the witch doctor and the medicine man or medicine woman, things like that. But that's just anthropologist laziness instead of calling the person uh, according to their particular uh, culture or guild what they are. They're just going to throw a blanket term on shaman. You know, so now we have, you know, well, I, I've been working with a South American shaman. Well, they don't have shaman in South America. You know, I've been working with a uh, a South African shaman. Well, they don't have shaman in South Africa. They have in Sangoma and they have Sanusi, but they don't have shaman. But the term is thrown around. And then you have a a class of people who are wealthy from the United States and Europe and places like that who can go to Peru and Brazil and different places in South America and Central America and take tourist doses of ayahuasca, do it twice and come back and set up their own modern shamanistic, um, you know, uh, uh, ways of people to come and take the what they deem to be medicine you know and ayahuasca may be medicine but mushrooms aren't medicine mushrooms are magic okay so what do you mean by mushrooms are magic they aren't medicine they're tools of exploration of the magical realms then they're not for um, post-traumatic stress disease or depression or to stop smoking or any, like, or any of these things. You can use them for those things at lower doses, but 
that's not um, that's not the purpose of mushrooms. The purpose of mushrooms is to go into the mystery and be able to learn to be able to explore your own consciousness. So number one, medicine, when you say so and such and such is the medicine, it automatically puts you in the position of being sick. You know, and mushrooms are not for sick sick people. And the modern view of even things like ayahuasca as medicine and uh, peyote and all these different types of things, they're not medicine. They're tools. The basis, uh, basis for, for knowledge to go into that mystery and to build your understanding of how you make the next step. Okay, thank you. Mm. So are there some things that you've seen in your waking sober life that are very magical that you would say the mushrooms led you to? Are there ways you navigate your life that use that sort of magic? Yeah, well, the mushrooms are always in you. Once, once you eat the mushrooms, they're always there. They're always there. And you're always in, in two different, two different worlds. And so, yes, mushrooms have helped me in my everyday life. Um, and I've gotten the chance to be able to, uh, at this point in my life, see different things from, uh, from different realms. You know, you see the shadow people, you see the, uh, densified, uh, waking dreams and things like that. But the, the thing is, is that your trip is always the same trip. Your life is always the same life. You are who you are. I don't adhere to the, the ego death of who you are, unless you talk about, about the false you that you've created as a persona. But who you are, you are, and you always be who you are. You don't lose that by going into the mystery. That's all you have, the I am that I am. Thank you. I find myself being really curious about the battles that you're talking about that you've experienced. Do you feel that they have any particular impact on the reality that we experience here? Well, <laughs> unless unless I've been saving the planet mode, no. There's no, um, uh, in the, many of the battles that I've had, there's no correlation with this um, uh, with this reality, with this construct, this has been uh, done on uh, higher and more pristine levels of connection to the uh, the the higher realms, the higher beings, in dealing with this whole uh, this whole uh, reality thing that we're talking about. So it's not really connected to the earth and humans and earthlings and those type of things, but uh, places that are so far from this as they, they might as well not even exist because they're in a whole different construct, a whole different magnitude of, of, uh, of hyper-reality. It's just a a finer system of being. Okay. Very interesting. So they're more like shamanic journeys for you, like more like personal journeys. Well, that's the only journey it is. Mm Mm-hmm. Each and every one of us, uh, we, we exist in a local neighborhood as connected beings. But then there are places 
that were not connected to each other. And they are standalone systems that have absolutely nothing to do with the system that we're in. In other words, how people were all one and we're all connected and we're just one being or entity experiencing a multitude of different experiences that uh, that whole thing. Yes, that's uh, partially correct and a good theory, but there are places that have absolutely nothing to do with being one. But uh, one of the mysteries of the universe or the multiverse or the infraparticle realm is that you're ultimately alone. And that aloneness is what drove you as a consciousness to create all of the different multiplicity, all the multiplicity of different forms and energies and worlds and galaxies and all the different things that could be experienced forever. So I'm curious what draws you to mushrooms as opposed to other entheogens? Well, mushrooms are the oldest. They have the most information. Uh, They are not from this earth. Uh, They're not plants. So they have a different um, affinity because we're more more closely um, aligned and associated with fungi than we are plants or any other of the kingdoms. So that's the reason. They're older. They are more dense as far as the informational structure is concerned, and they're not <laughs> they're not native earth plants. They are extraterrestrial organic technologies. And so that's what draws you personally to work with them. Yes. You know, if I want to ask a question about my family, I don't go to um, my, you know, 13 year old nephew. I go to my grandfather or great grandfather, if he's still around, or some of the elders in my family. The mushroom is the elder of these other things. You know, more than 65 million years before there were any plants. On land, mushrooms were here flourishing and uh, in a powerful state. Plants came later. So these are the ultimate ancestors. Well, they're the ultimate ancestral tools. The mushroom is still a a tool. It's still a... um, you know, it's still a organic construct. Somebody put it together. We don't know who put it together, but we know it's kind of like contact. Um, um, and the, you know, I guess most people didn't read the book, but many of you have seen the movie. And when uh, Jody Foster went into the device, the technology that the alien ancestors left when she got there, they made her feel welcome by the entity that she had conversation with. They put in the form of her father so that she wouldn't be scared of what it actually was as a being. And what he said was, is that many small steps, this is the way that it's always been done. You know, this thing that you're in and that you came through, we didn't originate it. It was here and we utilized it. Now we're presenting it to you guys. And it's a way to get you a small step into understanding of the uh, multiple resources of reality. It's not just what you all think. And then when she got back, they said, well, she didn't go anywhere. She just dropped. And uh, we do have video and audio. And he said, 
even though she only dropped in two seconds, they say it, it's, you know, uh, 13, <laughs> 13 days of information or, you know, 48 hours of information or whatever it was. It was just that uh, this technology is the way we've always do it. It's a way of communication, of time travel, of multidimensional travel. So it's the same with the mushroom. It's just an older construct. It's not an alchemy. It's whole within itself. And many other entheogens or psychedelics or hallucinogens are whole within themselves, you know, whether it be it's salvia or whether it be uh, different cacti and things like that, whether it's um, canary grass or whatever, you know, um, they're plants. And some of those plant entheogens are alchemy, such as ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a, a alchemy. You know it's younger, doesn't have as much information. Because number one, ancient people had to identify the two plants. They needed an entheogen to be able to do that. So they needed something to discover what those two plants were to put together to make the formula. You have to have water in a vessel to put the two plants in, to boil them, to drive them down. Meaning that you would have had to come to the point to where you could create a vessel to be able to hold this to bottle, to, to boil it. And then you have to have had to, to domesticate fire so that you could put the pot over top of it. And then you have the formula of how much to put in and all these different things. So it's an alchemy. It's the putting together of two things with a human mediator in there utilizing different elements to make this thing. The mushroom the hunters and gatherers on uh, the newly created grasslands on the African continent moving behind the herds, stealing meat from the from the time when they, uh, the, the big predators killed different things like zebra or wildebeest or uh, some proto cattle or something like that. After the big predators have eaten their feel, their, their feel of, of the, the meat, then the others come in, the jackals, you know, and, and other um, animals come in and get their feed. Then humans go in and steal a little bit of meat. Following those cattle and those other animals, they would, in the dung, observe the mushroom growing on the dung because it's coprophilic, it's dung loving. It inculcates itself or includes itself into the lowest part of the food chain. It grows on dung. So you're walking past a cow paddy and you see something that you might like as food, you pick it and you eat it. And it delivers the experience you don't have to have no pot. You don't have to have no fire. You don't have to have no identification of the different uh, fauna and flora of the area to be able to identify the different plants, to put them together, to heat them for a, lot, for a certain amount of time, to be able to drive it down, to be able to drink it and have that experience. So it's older. It's more pristine. It has the ability to deliver just from itself. Right. That makes sense. That's really interesting. So I'm curious, um, what sort of questions would you go into a mushroom journey with, or would you, would you advise somebody to go into a mushroom journey with? Since they're in your view, a technology like teachers, you know, holding information. Well, you could go in with the, uh, first with the basics, you know, what am I? Because, after all of this time, you know, all our science and our knowledge, we still don't know what we are. Where did we come from? You know, well, people will say, 
Well, <laughs> I came from my mother. Uh, I was created by my mother and father. And, well, where'd your mother and father come from? And where'd their mother and father come from? And where did their mother and father come from? And all, you could do that all the way back to the beginning of the earth and more. And we don't, as human beings, come from women. We come through women as a consciousness including itself into a body. The consciousness, what you are, who you are, doesn't come from another human being. You come from the mystery. What do you think is special about being human and being alive? I don't think anything special about being human and being alive. Everything is special. Everything is alive. Everything in part is made of the same substance. So that's like saying this is, uh, you know, take off that shoes because this is hollowed ground. This is holy ground. All ground is holy. All ground made out of the same stuff. All creatures are made out of the same thing. I like that. Everything's holy. You know, so no, that's that's uh, uh, <laughs> if, if that's not ego driven, it's it's pure modern day Christianity. Once it passed the 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 early stage of the stages of being a mushroom cult, you know that this thing is special. This person is special. This this edifice is special. Everything is special. You know, I used to. Uh, when the Jehovah Witnesses would come to the house, they would say, you know, um, I say, well, is God everything? And they'd say, yes. God is everything except the evil portion of it. I say, well, <laughs> if he's everything, he'd have to be the evil part too. You know, well, he lives in the in the heart of everything. I say, okay, well, he lives in the heart of everything. You know, my dog just took a uh, 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 shit out in the backyard is God inside of that shit? <laughs> they say, well, no, God wouldn't be in shit. Well, I say if God is in everything, he'd have to be in the shit. Is there a particular message that drives you personally to want to be a speaker on mushrooms? Is there something in particular that you want people to know? Well, I just want them to try the mushrooms. Yeah? You think people should? You don't think they're just for the very brave? Well, I think that everyone should try it and that if <laughs> if you have an affinity to it, uh, that's good. If you don't have an affinity to it, that's good also. But at least at least you stepped out of the three dimensional five sense reality of which we are embedded unless we take the tools to step out of that reality to show that there is something more. That's why um, the kakian in, uh, was used, so that people would know that there's more than just the regular everyday thing. That it's not just a tale of power, a tale of history. You know that okay, well there's a there's a, a a life after death and a heaven, and there's more out there that. You know, we get a chance to experience after we pass on and slough off the mortal body and things like that. This gives you a face to face, mouth to ear reality experience that there is more. Mm -hmm. Not somebody told me, not something that I read in a book, but something that I experienced. You know, I have a book that I've never read it and it has an old man on the front of it. And the title of the book is Hell, I Was There. In other words, this is something that I've seen, that I've experienced. Not something that somebody told me or something out of a book. Now, they'll say that, oh, well, that's just subjective reality. Well, there ain't no other, it ain't no other reality that it exists other than the subjective reality of what you experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get hit by a truck and reality ceases to exist in this dimension. 
and all of the things that you experience day to day in so-called regular reality no longer are part of reality. Unless you take some mushrooms in the dead land and visit this place. Because they do have entheogens inside of the entheogens. What? Entheogens inside of the entheogens. You can take 50, what do you mean? 50 grams of mushrooms and go out into the multiverse. And they have things out there that you can take and that you can smoke and that you can experience to go further in those realms. Wow. So it's like you take some mushrooms here and they got mushrooms on the other side that boost the rocket you into some other stuff that's a lot further away and a lot weirder and a lot uh, that's more, that's really more different than just hanging out under the mushrooms that you took from this realm. I've met creatures that want you to smoke with them and all that kind of stuff. Gin, uh, who do a lot of smoking out there. But I won't smoke with them unless I bring my own smoke. I don't smoke their stuff because they're mischievous. Well, that is very interesting. Hmm. So they have their own medicines or entheogens out there, and you don't trust them? No, uh, no. If I want to, if I want to take the, the, the entheogens out there, I do my own. I try to trap you in. <laughs> Trap you up and trip you up. Yeah. One, I was in what time I was out and I took a, cha- a puzzle challenge. The puzzle was to get out of a of a uh, a diodecahedron. And uh, once I stepped in, it started to getting smaller and shrinking. Each time you go, each time you try to get out, it will get smaller it becomes claustrophobic so you have to learn the art of shrinking and then it starts going faster and faster and as it's going faster and faster you have to learn how to shrink faster and faster and the way that I got out is that I shrunk faster than the puzzle was shrinking and ultimately I was able to go out between the quantum particles because it was slowing down because I was moving so fast so I could step through and stepped out into what the, what's, what's called the um, below the Planck length which is 10 to the negative 35 which scientists uh, uh People who are physicists, people who are mathematicians say that's the smallest area of a meter that you can't go any smaller. But then that's the limiting concepts of because you don't have a math a mathematical mathematical calculation to identify it that it doesn't exist, but it does exist. That's not where it stops at, that's where it begins at. And you go so small, get so small that you come out on the other side big, unimaginably big. But that's below the plank length where the super servers exist that build the macro reality of which we exist in. The magical quantum realm computers that are the that, that is the true magic that generates everything that exists. And that's a lot smaller than the plank length, but that's just a reference point of which we could talk about in the reality of which we're in. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I was hoping to hear some of these kind of adventure stories uh, that you're sharing. So, hmm, yeah, this is really interesting. I've never thought of such things. So you're, you've really explored some of the, the physical underpinnings of reality. Well, there's no really physical 
underpinnings of reality. There's nothing physical about it. It doesn't exist. It's a, um, it's a code. You know, it's a computer program. It's a construct. It's an illusion. It's a thought inside of a machine that is no longer a machine in the sense of how we think of machines here. We hear, we think of artificial and organic. Everything is artificial, even organic, because they put it together. They build it femtosecond to femtosecond. That's how it's, it's, it's solidified in reality of which we can touch and feel. Professor at the University of Maryland, um, he's the first man to get a PhD from MIT in supersymmetry. He had to teach his professors what supersymmetry was so that they could give him his PhD in supersymmetry. And he says that in the calculations of supersymmetry that he's went through, he said, embedded in the reality of what we exist are linear block correction codes and the same program that Facebook and Google and all of these things are running on is the same algorithms that are running the reality of what we exist. So it is just another level of the same thing is running on those supercomputers below the Planck length. So how Google runs is the same way that reality runs, just on a different magnitude. Hmm. And how does that understanding influence the way that we can transform our reality? Because if it's a computer code and it's written by something somewhere, it's hackable. Mm, it's hackable. So you can. How do we hack you it? Can get out of the, you can get out of the matrix. How how do we hack it? Yeah. <laughs> if <laughs> if we. If we hack it, everything is going to change, <laughs> you know, and, you know, I ain't that interested in worried about hacking it right now. I'm just exploring. I guess I want to hack it. Like, That's interesting. Because, he, I mean, you got forever in both directions. The rabbit hole is endless. Time is an illusion. You got eternity and forever. So we keep plodding along. We make our mistakes. We correct our mistakes. We travel. We experience. We love. We cry. We hate. All of the things that we came here to do that weren't available. It's a wonderful time to be here. And it's a wonderful time to be able to experience the things that we can experience now because in the comfort of your own home, you can grow your mushrooms without impacting the environment, without over-harvesting iboga or ayahuasca or cacti or any of these different type of things. You can grow it in the comfort of your own home. You can go on YouTube and find out how to grow it. You can order some spores off the network. These are things that <laughs> you would have been you would have been drawn and quartered for these are things that people the average person would never even have known about they would be held in guilds and different religious structures at the highest levels the regular people didn't get to them unless a little boy a little girl uh, walking along behind the cows encountered it on top of the cow pie and it called to them but the 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 secret magic of you know of the world was locked up in these things, and now with a little bit of little bit of effort, you can go into the mystery 
and learn and see things that have never been seen and never been experienced, hear the voices that have never been heard in the comfort of your own home, in your bed, in a safe environment on a long Saturday night. Right. So it's a good time to be here. It is. It's still illegal, but it's easier to access. Well, definitely easy to access and becoming decriminalized in certain places. And ultimately, it'll be not even looked upon as anything out the way. Right. And thank you, Kalindi, for the work that you're doing to help inspire people to explore the frontiers of consciousness like you are doing. Well, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, uh, look forward to seeing you again, again at certain uh, time when that's ready. And you have a great evening. All right. You too. Thank you very much. And as I end uh, every show, I like to say, may the plants be with you. May the plants be with you. Peace.